It's my beef for life Yeah This my beef for life Stand up When the chief is here Hands up Yeah, the chief is here Stand up When the chief is here Hands up Yeah, the chief is here Yeah This my beef for life Good afternoon, everybody. It's a bit of a Rob Chief day, so I'm feeling a little bit, I've got to keep the ego in play. I have all the props here. Um, I'm going to tell you, Gareth, about this very quickly. We've got a channel in a country, and I'm not going to name it, but it's North America, and it's not uh, the USA, and it's not Mexico. Um, okay. And they got, a couple of guys got quite upset about me wearing that. They said, unless you got it in a ceremony, it's quite offensive. Um, oh, yeah. So, so I said, well, <laughs> yeah, I got it in a ceremony, but I haven't told them which one, and we haven't actually done it yet. So just keep it quiet, okay? Everybody, <laughs> firstly, Gareth, welcome to our show. Um, Thank very you very proud much. To be and I made a commitment to the show that I wouldn't talk to you beforehand, wouldn't introduce myself, wouldn't say anything. Gareth kindly accepted to be on the show. So he's probably a bit mad. But I think one thing resonated with him, and that was in some email I said, no socialists. And that's oh, definitely yeah. something we agree on. And he does look a slightly younger, better looking version than me, of me. So <laughs> it's all a bit irritating today. But Gareth, welcome. We haven't had any chat about anything. This is really just to say, I know nothing about you. I know you're very famous uh, on radio. You're a very famous entertainer. I lived overseas for 31 years, from 1985 to three years ago. So when people say, oh my God, you should get Gareth Cliff on, I go, who? And I really, I don't watch TV or listen to the radio. So other than suspecting we may be like-minded, I have no idea. So you should ask me some questions and I'll ask you. Tell me what you do. I honestly don't know. You're, you're on radio, um, yeah? Well, I, I, I was on radio for about 15 years and on television for about the same amount of time. And for the last six years, I've been running my own business, which is called cliffcentral.com. We are Africa's biggest podcast business, and we do online streaming. We do um, content, branded content for, for businesses. And it's really, it's been going extremely well for the last six years until COVID came along. We were looking at having our best year ever. And now, largely as a result of our clients who are suffering because of the lockdowns, we, um, we've had to go into survival mode and it feels like we're in startup stage again, which is very frustrating, but it's really been an incredible six years, had a really good time. We've got a great team of people, about 10 people on staff who uh, are, are just pumping out really in incredible content. And I'm, I'm very proud of what we've built. And then I'm, I'm starting a new TV show this evening, actually. And there are lots of other projects on the go on the side as well. So you, you know what it's like, you have to have many irons in the fire. Tell us about the TV show. And also, I want to get back to your main business to ask yeah. how we can help you. Um, well, the TV show is really uh, an experiment in, in trying to get some ratings for ENCA. Um, they're, they're not doing badly. They're, they're a good news channel, and they've done some really good stuff over the years. But I think that probably this is a, an opportunity for them to explore a different kind of show. You know, I haven't done TV for four years now, and I'm not in any hurry to get back on because TV's really, it's its frustrating, it's irritating and annoying. And there's a lot of hurry up and wait, and it doesn't feel like real interaction. To me, this is far more like an actual conversation than you would have on television. But I've been persuaded to do it for a number of reasons. I think that there's a gap in the market for a, an interesting place for people to share ideas we can get really smart people instead of really stupid people on TV and get them to talk about things that actually affect people and discuss ideas and, and break down bad ones because it seems to me that a lot of really irritating and dumb things have been given free reign to just appear to be, um, you know, widely held wisdom. And, and, you know, you mentioned socialism at the beginning, but there are lots of other concepts that are just taken as part of, you know, the option for the rest of humanity. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, of, of there's a lack of curiosity maybe in the mainstream I love media. Say. And I think part of the blame or a lot of the blame goes to the education agenda that's been captured by the left. 
and yeah. people have been taught garbage like socialism can work it can't work it's for morons and yeah. i can happy well, to explain you, you know what happened on the show i mean it, what's what's happened there is that you're, you're absolutely right about the left being captured uh, by or the academics being captured by the left and and then transferring that stupidity onto to young people and i think it's almost like a poisonous stockholm syndrome that's developed as a result of that where people feel that if they're not if they don't buy into that socialism and they don't buy into that leftism on campus that they probably don't have a place in academia and maybe that they aren't even going to get their degree because you certainly can't write anything publish anything or voice an opinion that isn't to the left in in south so, african universities so my one of my son dreadful. it's dangerous one of my sons is uct so he mm. born in england grew up in england went to university one year at northeastern and then has came here to do business science and uh, I won't give you his name but it's Luke Hersov and he said that <laughs> he had a paper in his first year here at UCT which was fa about fake news and he wrote he said fake news is on both sides it's it's yeah. Fox News and CNN he said it was one of the best papers he'd ever written he yeah. got like 60 percent and he said it was one entirely due to the lecturer being a sniveling lefty who yeah. who the fact he mentioned CNN can be fake news marked him down. And that, and he and, and other intelligent people who are conservatives, the two are linked, by the way, um, all agreed that to get through university, just have your head down slightly, read between the lines, get the grades, but think for yourself. I mean, the left are just well, pernicious. I, don't know. I must be honest with you. I don't even think that university is particularly useful anymore. I think particularly the humanities are an absolute waste of time. And if you're studying wow. anything that isn't engineering, science, mathematics, accounting. Um, and, and, and accounting, physics and chemistry, if you're not studying those things, you, you are wasting your parents' money and you should be embarrassed and ashamed of yourself for going to an institution and allowing yourself to be indoctrinated with nonsense. You know, Gareth, I'd put a little uh, uh, codicil on that. And that is if you go to an unbelievable university like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Oxford, mm. Cambridge, then I don't mind what you studied because to get in there is still incredibly difficult despite quotas and all that nonsense. You know, I hired a, a guy, Char I won't give you his name, but it's Charlie Daniel. Seven years ago, came out, came out of Bristol or Leeds and he did, I don't know, I can't even remember, theology or a BA. But he, since working with me, has taught himself accounting and he's one of the best people I've ever hired. He's, he's just a, unbelievable. So great university. I'm not... I don't mind what Look, I, I, the reason I say that the reason I say that I think universities are probably not as as useful as they they once were is because education is now available to everyone online and if you're a smart person you will find the information that you need yeah. on the internet I have I I'm I'm a, a an amateur inorganic chemist it's one of my many hobbies now I've, I've built a laboratory in my house which you mustn't tell my insurance company about but everyone else is welcome to know and I I I've learned Everything I know about inorganic chemistry, and I, I know a, a fair amount. I would say that I, you know, I could probably get by with a if you gave me a bachelor of science degree level examination now, I'd probably get eighty to ninety percent at that. Masters probably not, but you know, I'm I'm competent and I understand enough about inorganic chemistry to tell you how different kinds of you know uh, compounds are formed, ionic or covalent how bonds. Long? Which, which element is which on the periodic table and that kind of thing. But the point that I'm trying to make is that that information is all online. When I was younger, there wasn't an internet and you had to buy books or you had to go to libraries to get books. And, and if you were curious, that's what you would do. Um, people who are not curious about the world aren't going to suddenly find information just because the internet is there. And unfortunately, the universities have become places of ideological indoctrination. And in South Africa, they've become feeding and housing schemes for wastrels who have nothing to do and get student loans between going out and finding a work, a job of work and doing something valuable to the economy and leaving school with good marks. And the ones who don't get good marks are in an even worse position, I'm afraid. I mean, it is a joke. So how long have you been self-studying inorganic chemistry? Is it months weeks years no days. since i was since i was 14 years old i've i've been obsessed with this stuff my my parents were used to live on a farm um and i was probably 15 or 16. my parents used to hear an explosion from my <laughs> bedroom 
and they'd come running out and say, what the hell, what have you done? And I'd come out going, I'm fine, I'm fine, with sort of burn marks on my hands and all kinds of things. But it's a, it's a curiosity. I mean, I'm interested in architecture, inorganic chemistry, history, music, um, edged weapons, I mean, paintings. There's lots of stuff that I care about. And I think that that's because I'm just a curious person. I've never, I, I don't intend to be a master at any of these subjects. I don't intend to practice any of them as my, as my job, but they're things that I care about. And if, if I can get into a conversation with you or anyone else about one of those subjects, to me, that's much more gratifying than talking about work. But, you know, I think that the disapproval applies not only to students and young people, but our age group too. So I, came, I spent 31 years abroad finding fame and fortune, and I found lots of it and came back home three and a half years ago. And I'm a Jobo boy, but I've been forced by my New Zealand wife, you met just now, Casey, to, yes. to come and live in paradise in Cape Town. And I just struggled. I just, after a month or so of going to dinner parties, I just started arguments. I really, I just started arguments because, and somebody came up to me and said, I know what you're doing. You're bored. You're getting no feedback from anyone, no interesting commentary from anyone. So you're just starting arguments. I went, okay, that's very true. Because yeah, the bubble of Bishop's Court, sorry to pick on my neighbors, but man, there's some people here that haven't read a book in 59 years. It's embarrassing and, and it's not good well, to either. I must tell you, on, on the on the note of your son, Luke, and, and what he learned at university and what he had to do there in order to just get through it and put his head down, as you, as you put it, I got a, a really horrible email from a kid who's at school. Again, I'm not going to name the school because I think it would prejudice him. But this kid sent an email to me saying, hey, Gareth, I'm going to read it to you right now. I go to an extremely progressive and forward-thinking high school. We only start exams in grade 10 and we don't have a uniform. I would like to present to you a document that my fellow classmates have written. The document relates to the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't necessarily agree with the demands in the document, but I send, send this to you to bring light to the situation of the way my generation forms its opinions, and that being herd thought, herd mentality. This document has the power to destroy my unique skill and many other students in any schools if we've written similar letters but in the opposite direction. This is not the way I want my generation to go. So this is a kid under the age of 18 who sent me this letter called Transformation at the School. And it's written obviously by people who've just copied the nonsense that they see in political uh, leftist um, university thought in America. And it's, it's absolute tripe. So my response to him, I mean, I felt sorry for this kid because I think he deserved a reply. I said, hi, Benjamin, thanks for sending this to me. I very much agree with you and can tell you honestly that this document is absolute rubbish. It is intellectually immature and panders to irrelevant events overseas. It's also a work of fiction. I would be embarrassed to be associated with it, and you can do well to distance yourself from it. Good luck. Let them know you disagree, even if it reveals who your real friends are, yours, Gareth. Now, that's scary. Tell them to contact me for an internship or a job. No, I, I, I'm sure there'll be plenty. Of, he, he's a smart enough kid, but thank you. I will. Yeah. Um, you know, that there are there are lots of very smart people, and, and I can't help thinking that this is driving otherwise moderate people into the arms of some rather darker and more dangerous and more right-wing elements. Now, I don't like the right-wing. I would always have considered myself a classical liberal in, in the old definition oh. of classical liberal. Yeah, where someone is pro-free speech, where they believe in, in the sovereignty of the individual and that kind of thing. And I think that that's still where I see myself. But unfortunately, the, 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 what they call the Overton window, which I know you're familiar with, is, is something that's moved so much to the left now that it is beyond the pale for people to talk about free speech because free speech equals racism and hate speech to some people. You know, they've become the new fascists. Fascists well, they, they are fascists. I mean, I saw a brilliant, a brilliant argument between Dinesh D'Souza and some upstart at a university about yeah. how, he's terrific, about how this, this um, wannabe liberal, this wannabe <laughs> lefty, who's all of 18 years old and not nearly as smart as Benjamin, whose letter I just referred to, said to Dinesh, oh, but how can you put progressivism and fascism and communism in the same category? because Hitler and Stalin were enemies. And 
Dinesh D'Souza very deftly said, well, the only difference between Hitler and Stalin wasn't the socialism part, it was the nationalism part. Hitler just thought Berlin should tell Moscow what to do, and Moscow thought Berlin should be told what to do on Stalin's side. And that's exactly the point. Totalitarian dictators don't actually care about ideology. What they want is power, and I'm afraid the ideology is being used, and it's been used to great effect in places like Venezuela, and to their great detriment. And you don't need to look very far. Our northern border of Zimbabwe has promised the people, the community, these buzzwords that people throw around. Um, all these, all these uh, marvelous um, turns of, of, of uh, fortune for them that have never, ever arrived. And all you see in the wake of socialism and all you see in the wake of leftism and progressivism in the world is misery and less control for people of their own lives, the breakdown of the family, and the destruction of society, not the, the sharing of things. And it seems such crass materialism for the left to even talk about um, anything more than just this, this, this very basic materialism. It's, it's, what can I get from you? And if you can give me something, then I win. Do you know what worries me, Gareth, is that you know, there's some really scary monsters out there you know, China, Russia, that are going for world domination. They don't agree with each other, but they've got one enemy, and that's the West right now. And then things will change. In the West, we well, China's got China's, by the way, China's got a big enemy in India, and we should be on and we should be on India's and side. And they play cricket. So we the Indians, the Sikhs in with their turbans up in the Kashmir, have got to kick Chinese ass, please. Come on the Indians. They're very much our allies. In fact, the Anglosphere, let's talk the Anglosphere. I mean, the Canadians are a bunch of wussies with Trudeau, but, you know, Australia, how do we stop undermining ourselves? You yeah, know, well, this is, this is as a direct result of, of our, our own idea of what multiculturalism and diversity should be. And, you know, Christopher Hitchens is probably my favorite author of, Peterson. Yeah. of, of, of any... Uh, you know, Peter's brother. Um, if 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 there has been a writer who's been contemporaneous with any of us and who has changed the world with every single one of his works, it's got to be Hitchens. He not only has contributed enormously to literature, of which he was a critic, an early critic. His his political dissertations are profound in every sense of that word, and his his debate, his ability, his articulate and cogent ability to formulate the most extraordinary arguments that make sense even to a complete fool at one end and the smartest and most supercilious people at the other this guy is just i mean if you if i suggest to anyone read a book it's got to be anything by hitchens really so give and me your wrote, give me your he wrote three a great book called uh, why all will matters and i've actually got this book i keep on my desk with me all the time 1984 and it's no more relevant now than Unbelievable. i mean it's more relevant now perhaps than than it has been in in 50 years so, so you, you were asking you, what three books are you libertarian i mean i'm yes. fundamentally a no. judeo-christian conservatarian if you can digest that okay um, yeah I, I think that's a good definition it's quite broad but i think that's that work for me as well if you had to recommend to some dopey lefty Oh, sorry, an intelligent lefty, and there must be some. You know, David Rubin migrated from being a Bernie Sanders lefty to being a conservative Republican. Candace Owens, who I've got on a webinar coming up yes. in July, very proud, is an amazing woman. The she's same, great. She was a Democrat lefty, and yeah. she, saw, she saw the light, saw the right. If you had to give people like that, that you think can evolve three or four books, what would they be? Would they be well, an Ayn Rand? Would they be a... Yeah, you know, I think, look, I, Ayn Rand is terrific, and I've got I've got a copy of Atlas Shrugged. Here we are. <laughs> that's right the one. There, that, that white yeah. one up there. That's yeah. Atlas Shrugged, which is a magnificent work. And, magnificent. you know, all it, 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 even if you don't buy into the ideology whole scale, and, and you know, whether she was a, an absolute capitalist or not is still up for debate, but she was a terrific writer, and her books... I think ring true for so many people because they see the world that way in a practical sense. They're not seeing it in some utopian sense. You know, I always ask lefties, 
you say America is so bad and you say Britain is so bad. Compared to what? Korea, North Korea, Venezuela. But, yeah, choose, choose any, any place you like. Um, compared to what? Because there isn't a country in the world that is more multicultural than the United States. There isn't a country in the world that's freer than the United States. There isn't a country in the world that for an immigrant is a better prospect. And you don't need to believe me. Just look at where the traffic goes. Do you see a lot of people hopping on boats in Miami and trying to get to Cuba? Zero. Have you ever seen traffic going that way? There isn't any. No one is immigrating to Cuba. It's just like no one goes from North Korea to South Korea. And when you look at a map of the world, if you see a satellite well, picture of they'd the like to, They'd like to. They'd like to go north to south. You mean south to north. I'm, I, I mean south to north, sorry. The, nor the, northern, uh, the northern ones are the communists. Now, if you look at what Kim Jong-un's lovely North Korea looks like by satellite at night, there are no lights there. And you can actually oh, see the green and the terrain zone. And then below that, you see lots of lights where South Korea is. And what's interesting about that is that, again, there is progress, there is uh, security, there is um, individual sovereignty, there is the free flow of ideas in countries like America and South Korea and India to a larger degree than most people are willing to be, to be, um, to be told. Um, Britain, although Britain is becoming increasingly politically correct, and they're shutting down, the, they're closing the taps of the great fountainhead of their own intellectual enlightenment. And it makes me very, very sad. I don't think that tide's happened yet. Um, there's, you know, the youth are turning conservative. They're not going to yes, put up. But, but there are people who just this week uh, wanted to tear down Winston Churchill's statue and they had to board him up in Parliament Square, which is one of the well, saddest things you can imagine. Sadiq Khan, I'm being polite now as a piece of shit. So sorry, I'm being really polite. I'm being quite rude to normal pieces of shit, but he is. He really yeah. is a wasted. Yeah, no, he really is. Sadiq Khan, get out. Um, so the books that you recommend are an Ayn Rand, uh, Atlas Shrug. Yeah, I'd um, put George Orwell in there because I think he's really good. And Sovereign Individual. Um, well, you know, I'm, uh, because I'm a history fan, I'll just tell you now, because there are a lot to choose from, and it's it's very hard to choose your favorite three. If I asked you to choose among your three kids, which one is your favorite, you'd have a tough time. So, my wife. <laughs> I choose different. my wife. <laughs> um, no, there, there are a few here that are really good. Um, there's a terrific book about, about Mao Zedong, which is by uh, Halliday, which I read a while ago, which was quite enlightening about how you know, just how, how wicked that whole regime is. Because China was passed over for what the Soviet Union was doing. And China really operated in their shadow for a long time. Um, and that book puts in stark contrast the ugly realizations of, of what the Chinese people have suffered under for the last 70 years. And, you know, they had a big party last year for um, 50 years of, of, of pure communism or 70 years of pure communism or whatever it was. And and the only reason that that country has achieved anything is because they had the, the smarts uh, the two generations after Mao to open up their economy. And they pretend to be communists, but actually they're more capitalistic than anyone else in the world and crony capitalistic at that. Yeah, I've been there and seen military officers inside a supermarket buying everything they can. It's actually an extraordinary sight. Um, but is there hope? I mean, you know, for good people, and everyone on this group today are probably a few ANC spies, and, but mostly good, <laughs> smutbees good. good people. Smutbee, smut, smutbees for life. You're a smutbee. are good people. What hope is there? I mean, is it all over? And then let's talk South Africa. Well, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think that there are, there are many good people who are trying to do good things. And I think that it's it's always worth looking at the glass as being half full because I'm not a suicidal lunatic, first of all. Um, I'm, I'm happy we, with, with me. And I, I said up to the beginning of this year when, when this coronavirus started to become a reality, I'd always said that this is the best time to be alive. And I still maintain that even with coronavirus because we have at our disposal these incredible devices that connect us to each other and the world there has never been such a profusion of knowledge. There's never been such opportunity for people with good ideas and people with good intentions. 
And if you are one of those people, there will always be something for you to do. And there will always be a place for you to ply your trade and, and to grow a, a tribe around you. And we've all got to essentially grow these tribes. And they might not be tribes in the old sense that we all live together or hunt together, but that we share basic ideas and never underestimate the, the power of the silent majority. And I think that there are a vast number of people in this country of ours who are at heart conservatives. And I'm talking about black people, a lot of them in the rural areas, who believe in the family, who believe in, uh, in, in doing the right thing, who believe in God, who believe in you know, making an effort to, to, to not uh, break down those institutions, institutions which serve them well and to, and to grow their capacity to help others rather than what we see in the news all the, all the time, which is just corruption and ugliness and, and depravity. Gareth, before we go to South Africa, I want to pick up on something that your Pepra has brought up here. Let's take North Korea um, and Cuba as examples. So yes. in the late 80s, unsurprisingly to the lefties around, mm -hmm. I worked for Rupert Murdoch's right-hand man. Not left-hand man. I'm never going to be a left-hand man. Right-hand man. And I, were, I went to every trip with him, carried his bag, wrote some of his speeches. And I was part, part author of his MacArthur lecture at Edinburgh. We basically said to the BBC, BBC was saying, we're quality. We know what's going on. He was like, bullshit. Let the people decide quality. Let there be competition. But he'd made a speech beforehand, which was one of the things that brought down the Berlin Wall, where he basically said, you know, let them have the MTV. The East Germans are looking over the wall and going, I want my MTV. Let's flood them with CDs of music and books and videos and things. And eventually the East Germans are like, fuck it, these commies are a bunch of shits. Let's, let's break the wall. Couldn't we? So what, if, what, is, what, is Yao, what does Yao want to know? I think Yao's saying, I think what he's saying, well, I'm going to read into it. Could we not have flooded Cuba with fantastic books and literature and topless chicks and music and, you know, wonderful Western culture and civilization where the Cubans go, you know, Fidel, you're full of shit, we're out of here. Instead of sanctions and a war, you know, break down the wall, flood them with wondrousness of the West. Could well, that not have worked better? I, you know, I have a feeling. You know, I, I, have to, I have to disclose first off that Yao and I are old friends. We've known each other for probably about 10 to 12 years. And, um, and, and, and he actually sent me a message earlier today, which I didn't respond to, where he asked, what do you, what do you really think of socialism? And I thought to make him wait for, for this discussion would probably be a good idea. But yeah, look, it depends on, on how, how keen you are to win people over to your side and how important it is for you to win. Um, I, I think that there will always be places, and thank God for it, where different ideas take root and where we can explore different ways of living together. I do think that the best menu and recipe for happy human interaction and maximal freedom and the, the, the option of having as many choices as possible is in Western liberal democracy. I, I do not see a better system. You know, Churchill himself used to say, democracy is a terrible system, but it is the best of the worst. So we have we have nothing to compare it to yet and everything that's been attempted that is very very different has failed horribly and and we've got to also remember that humanity has this long and ugly history of tyranny and it's maybe our default setting that we prefer having a strong man in charge and maybe deep down inside that's what appeals to most of us is is this idea of being ruled over and being uh, controlled by some father figure um, that that may be true for many of us and maybe we just don't we're not comfortable with uh, with figuring it out for ourselves. It's maybe so easier to just delegate that to someone else. Oh, by the way, someone's mentioned here Yuval Noah Harari. So I yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion. He's got three books. The first two, which you have to read sequentially, Sapiens, which is absolutely the most incredible uh, condensed history and comprehensively honest take on humanity. And then the second book, Homo Deus, which is equally excellent. And Homo Deus is really about where we go from here. Um, whereas Sapiens is, is historical, this one is much more what's in the future for humans. So let's talk about South Africa. Um, you know, I was away 31 years. I really did get homesick. I came back, wife and kids, 
with Zoomer in charge. And I said to my wife, you will only be here for four years because Zoom is a gangster and a crook and a moron yeah. and he's going to destroy everything. We've got four years left to you know, compromise the judiciary takes about six years. We're about two years in. We're basically, you know, judges get bribed, which yeah. does, I reckon, 20% of the judges are bribed. Um, mm -hmm. Then Cyril gets elected. My wife goes, what's that mean? I said, kick the can down the road. Because the ANC is fundamentally kleptocrats, ineptocrats, socialists. I mean, maybe they pretend to be socialists so they can steal. But it, 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 we're just not going to go anywhere. With, with If you look around those cabinet ministers, I mean, Tito's okay, Zwilly's okay, the rest. I wouldn't hire them in my grade school. No, student. but this is this is a good point that you make. And when I, in the first week of lockdown, expressed some concern that we were allowing the people who had run all the parastatals into the ground to suddenly make decisions about our health, and you had supposedly smart people who up to two weeks before the lockdown had said, oh, no, we would never vote for this government. And clearly they're inept. We're saying two weeks after the lockdown, no, no, you've got to back Cyril. Cyril's doing the right thing. He's looking after us. They're fucking stupid. And there's no two ways about it. Those they're people, are, they really are. And, and there's, I, I'm sorry, but there is nothing in their logbook of failure that gives me any faith that these are people that, A, care about the ordinary citizen in South Africa. They absolutely don't care about the poor. That is available for everyone to see. Uh, the, the evidence, the ev evidence, don't listen to what they say, look at what they do. And I'm afraid they have let down the poor rural black person in South Africa more than they've let down anyone else. And all they've done is made every one of us a little poorer than we need to be. I mean, it's embarrassing, actually. I, I... And all the lefties, the Swedish and the others who, who were ranting and raving, what do they say mm. now? Don't say boo. Well, well yes, yeah. I, I'm afraid. Look, the um, the old allies. It was a, it was an honourable thing to end apartheid. Let's not mix. I'm a good thing. Let's not mix two two non categorical things here. I think everyone is pleased that apartheid's over, and everyone is pleased that there is that much more freedom for the individual. And that I'm not going to disagree with at all. I have no problem with it. In fact, uh, considering I was the first election I voted in was the second democratic election in South Africa, and I was pleased that everyone in the country had a vote, and I was pleased that we had a government that was representative of the people. I believe in democracy. I believe in liberal democracy. And because and I also what, had, sorry? And then what happened? Well, I think <laughs> Nelson Mandela came along and he was a, he was a, a real uh, symbol of what we could be. And he did a tremendous job of, of enthusing South Africans with the idea that we were a noble place with a noble vision where everyone could find their place in the sun. And again, we can have no problem with that unless you're a psychopath. And Tabo Mbeki came along and said, yes, this is all good and well, but we also need to make sure that there is more economic inclusivity and we need to grow this economy, which again, no one can really have a problem with. And I didn't. And then at Polo Kwane, I am happy to admit I was completely wrong because I was so afraid of Tabo Mbeki becoming a centrist African tin pot dictator because he'd surrounded himself with yes men and, and he used to write these long, boring newsletters every week on the NC website. And I thought this guy doesn't have the charisma to take us to the next level and I'm concerned that he's actually just a technocrat, um, which may have been true. But if I could go back now, I would have been less appreciative of what happened at Polokwane, because I thought, oh yay, this this you know, this coalition of the weak and and the um, and the disenchanted, these people are better than Tabo Mbeki and his coterie. Yeah, and I, I was wrong. I was completely Darwin, wrong. We're here today. Go three years forward and look back. We might be praying, saying, "Oh my God, I wish we had Cyril back," because there are some monsters lurking in the wings there, and they, you know, one, yeah. you know trip and bang his head and look who stands up and we all would would pray in three years time Cyril to head stayed you know what I mean it just well haven't haven't the ANC done as much damage as it's possible to do with this lockdown they've destroyed small businesses mm. they have they've they've probably doubled unemployment and let's not be under any illusion this lockdown is not the, the decision of some extraneous body. It's not a collective decision by the people of South Africa either. This is an ANC decision. This government decided to put people out of work. 
this government decided to prevent you and me and a whole lot of other people from trading during this time. This government is wholly responsible for everything that happens as a result of this lockdown. And let me tell you, even Lindy Wazulu, who has the, the intellectual capacity of my dog, Carl, is able to tell that she's fucked up because she said as, she said as much in the news this week. And Trevor, Trevor's woken up for once to realize what a piece of crap the ANC are. Thank you, Trevor. Well, Long enough yeah, time. I've always had a lot of time for Trevor Manuel. I, I also used to have a lot of time for Cyril, but what we seem to forget is that Cyril was there as a, uh, a, a deputy to Jacob Zuma during his most excessive, uh, most, most stupid and most tyrannical episodes. And Cyril did nothing. He didn't whimper. He didn't raise an objection. And to anyone else's, uh, to, to anyone else's knowledge, he, he had nothing to say. He was mute for that entire time. Yeah. Let me make a point that your once again brings up, but I'm going to really spin it. He says, but didn't other countries do the same? If you're really stupid and you have to make a tough decision, what do you do? You, you ask people who know. Expert, or you copy what everyone else is doing. So we know the ANC and the government are fundamentally stupid. We know that. I mean, look at their school grades, unless they rob them. Um, they just copied other countries saying, if we do the same, we'll get away with it. I think that happened. There wasn't a lot of thought. Um, you, you mentioned Tito and William Kizer, and I, I would also controversially say, in Cosa San Adlamini Zuma, these are not stupid people. Uh, and neither, neither is um, Patel. But the problem with, with Patel and Zuma is that they're also ideologues. Uh, Zuelim Kize seems to me to be a fairly reasonable human being, although his predilections for the N NHI worry me enormously. And and Tito, I know, is is a very smart man who spent an, an, an enormous amount of time in the private sector figuring out how private banking works. He was with Goldman Sachs for some time. He certainly has immersed himself in economics and has a better understanding than all the others in the ANC. But when he goes to an NEC meeting, no one listens to him because what he's saying isn't populist rhetoric and nonsense. And that's the stuff that the ANC has been feeding on for 30 years. So you still remain an optimist? You're cautiously optimistic. Why? How? There's nothing to be optimistic about. I just, I I want to answer, I just want to answer a question here from DB who said, why is he blaming the government? It's COVID. 40 million people are unemployed in the US looking for a scapegoat. President did a great job and at the time was applauded. Sweden never worked. Well, no, that's not true. Um, the <laughs> government decided to lock down. And Sweden, the, the results are still out. We still don't know. Sweden obviously has many more deaths in the beginning because they've decided to go with this herd immunity idea. Texas and Florida in the United States didn't lock down at all. And their economies are still robust. The rest of America is still locked down. And I don't think things are going so well for them. Certainly, all that unemployment isn't coming from Florida and Texas. So, DB, it is the government's fault. They David made that decision. It's David Berman. He's actually uh, loves ah. his right. He is, is a Very capital. Good. And a, a decent chess player, so David. Oh, very good. On. Okay, um, and then someone else here says uh, this is a good one. Gareth, do you share Christopher Hitchens' views on religion? You know, he was um, he was very influential in me in my late twenties, early thirties when it came to religion. I've moderated my opinion somewhat. I used to be one of those militant atheists who was a pain in the ass to have dinner with because I would start telling you how stupid you were and, and it was unacceptable. And there are still some remnants of that person in me, but I certainly think with regard to religion, people are uh, welcome to have their, their beliefs and they're welcome to, um, to proselytize on behalf of those beliefs. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm not threatened by them. And I no longer go around telling people that they're wrong. I think that it's a, it's a, it's a bad you, idea you, to do that, especially with respect to religion. Are you an atheist? Yes. So I've sort of waxed and waned uh, on religion, but I think fundamentally it's a very good thing. And, a, you know, it's, oh, yeah. almost to, it's almost easier to prove God exists than God doesn't exist. And I haven't made well, there, there are lots of things that religion still has on its rap sheet that are not particularly pleasant, and I don't need to go yeah. into those. But what I, I had a, a discussion with a friend of mine the other day, and we both came to the conclusion that if we have to choose whether or not to ally ourselves with you know, uh, Orthodox Jews, fundamentalist Christians, and 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 Muslims of of the um, 
of the strictest kind against leftism, that's a good alliance. I would rather suspend my disagreements as an atheist with them so that we can have good morals, good values, order, a uh, society do. which respects itself and each other than to throw them under the bus and find myself without allies against political ideologues who are far more dangerous because all they crave is power. 100% agree. 100%. I mean, in the order of things, you can have a hierarchy of religions where you might say, you know, atheists are top and then maybe, you know, liberal Jews are the next and whatever, you know, left footers are down here and, you know, we love Muslims are great people, but their ideology is a bit messed up because they haven't had a reformation. But fundamentally, even the conservatives are better than those lefties because they are undermining good things for everyone. I mean, it's just dreadful. Um, God, where yeah, are we I, now? I, I have, I have, a, I have a, a six monthly lunch with a, a rabbi in Johannesburg who is one of the most interesting people I've ever met. And he and I talk as regularly as we can. And we have that, that, that every six months we have that lunch. And I find him to be one of the most wise, calm, sedate, sensible, reasonable people, despite being a religious man, uh, far more so than many of the atheist academics that I've spoken to. And I like speaking to him and he, he fills up uh, my head as well as my soul every time I meet him. And I think that that's, that is a credit to religion, which reason doesn't necessarily possess in the same quantity. It certainly doesn't have the same way of getting to you that religion does. And I'm unlikely to become a convert to any of this, but I do like the way that all of these people are trying to make the world better one person at a time or one congregation at a time. And I think that's laudable. So what makes me very sad, and you read about it all the time, is you know, I returned back, I came back after 31 years, but the traffic the other way of extraordinary people is diabolical. Mm. Yeah. The richest people in LA are South African. The richest is Patrick Sunshong, who owns the Lakers. South Af born and grew up in South Africa. None of you knew that. Uh, medical device business, Elon Musk. I mean, I can go Peter Thiel. Uh, uh, Peter wasn't born here. Uh, tons of South Africans in every country are all in the top 10 of the richest now and moving up the ranks, you know. Half of the richest in Israel, one of the smartest countries in the world, are from South Africa. Yeah, that's they're also not true. Here, but they're not here. You know, is it just we are extraordinary, so we'll do well anywhere in the world? Or what is that all about? Uh, I don't. I don't believe in South African exceptionalism, if that's what you're asking. But I do think we are hard workers, and I think South Africans take nothing for granted because before apartheid ended, you could have had anything that was yours expropriated by that government. And now the ANC are bringing in expropriation too. So you're never secure as, as a hardworking South African. You don't know really whether you're going to have what is supposedly yours for very long. And I think that keeps us all on our toes, white and black, rich and poor. And I think we also, we know that this is a bit of a, a combination of the first world and the third world. We know that we are in this incredible overlap where the two magisteria are producing really interesting results, where someone who has a great idea or innovation uh, is able to try that out in the first world market of Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, and in the third world market of rural KwaZulu-Natal or the Eastern Cape. And I think that gives us some advantages. And I do believe that diversity in our motto of our coat of arms, the old one and the new one, unity and diversity, diversity has tremendous um, application and and I don't believe in diversity just for the sake of it like left leftists do where they want you know one Indian male one uh, Taiwanese female one black uh, guy in a wheelchair one lesbian Jewish woman etc etc I think that that's the kind of tokenism that will get us nowhere and leads to banality frankly it does no credit to each of those cultures or to each of those individuals it, it, it lumps people into groups and it doesn't give them any space to be better than their group's weakest person. And you're always judged by the lowest hanging fruit in your group. So if that's the case, that's not good for whites, blacks, lesbians, transgender people, people in wheelchairs, or from anywhere. Um, uh, what, I, what I like, yeah. sorry? Leftist categorization is how they keep control. Yeah. 
But where diversity has been helpful to us in South Africa is that it's allowed us to, to, to learn about those we live among who are not like us. And because in South Africa we have such tactile interaction, certainly before COVID came along, with people who are much, much richer, much, much poorer, um, darker, lighter, taller, shorter, speak this language or one of the other nine official languages. You know, we have an ability, therefore, to, um, to transcend what people who are extremely homogenous in their culture take for granted. We seem to have an ability to, to be able to market ourselves differently into different markets. And I think it's a strength of growing up in a country and living in a country and doing business in a country which is diverse. So let's, let's you know, it's easy to criticize because there's so much bad, but let's call out some good. There are some extraordinarily brave people in this country who are standing up and being counted. And for the time being, we, we still have free speech relatively. So yeah. which is a good thing. You know, I have a Zimbabwean friend, a very close friend of mine, who says, at least you can say things in this country which you can't in my country. So, yes. you know, I actually call some people out for bravery. You know, Musi Maimani, big fan of his. Herman Mashaba, whatever you think of his views. He's brave. He's standing up there. He's being counted. Um, Johan Rupert is one of the few, you know, white, wealthy people that stands up and tells it like it is. He's been brave. He's a national treasure. He's brave. He, he'll tell them what he believes. I, I'm, I'm with you on two out of three. Um, I know that Musi is a friend of yours, but I'm afraid Musi has really squandered the goodwill that he had. And, and I've, I've unfortunately come to the realization, as I, I'm sure many people have, that he's a, he's a good poster boy, but that there's not a whole lot going on behind the scenes. And I, maybe I misread the man. I have I a lot of time for Herman Mashaba. I have a lot of time for Johan Rupert. But Musi's always struck me as being rather insubstantial, if you don't mind my saying. I think wait and see. I think he's got a big second act and it's coming. And I think you should spend a bit of time with him. And he's insightful and brave. And I'm a big fan of it. So yeah. I, I think give him a shot. I'm a big fan. I, big... I think he's squandered a lot of goodwill, unfortunately. And, you know, that's hard to, to reclaim in politics. It's very difficult. I think he has an uphill battle ahead of him. And I'm just concerned that, that Musi was always just window dressing. Whereas someone like Herman Mashaba is a, is a real tooth and nail fighter yes. and Herman Mashaba is a, a real man you know he's a he's a he's the kind of guy who I think does precisely he he has what I I like to define integrity by he says what he means and he does what he says who else who else well, you know, slim pickings that? slim pickings yeah Helen I like Helen Zilla I have a lot of time for Helen Zilla. She's she's done a few stupid things, but then on social media, who hasn't? And uh, I've always yeah. had tremendous respect for her because I think that Helen Zilla is uh, she's brave beyond belief. She is so principled. Uh, she and I would disagree on things like the capable state, for example. She's a really big pundit of of you know the government can work for the people. I think government is probably, and you're probably likely to agree with me since you're a libertarian. The smaller the government, the better. I see well, a suggestion here of Tuli Madoncela. Yeah, absolutely. She's great. Right. But I also think Tuli Madoncela is, she's the soft version. We need people like her, but she's the soft version of, of what we actually need in criminal justice in South Africa at the moment. And what we need there is, is maybe a Glynis Breitenbach. Okay, so let's get right back to the beginning. So your business that is struggling, how can we help you? Because I have a business. Well, it's, yeah, a it's, business. Not so much the, it's not so much the business. It's, um, it's our clients who are having a tough time at the moment. You know, we create branded content for, for businesses. So we'll help you to craft a podcast series about wine or to tell the story of your business, which is hard to do in traditional media because you have so limited a bandwidth. What we are able to do is we've got people who craft beautiful stories, who put them together in sound and video, and allow people to explain things which otherwise are difficult to do in a 30 second commercial. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I want to talk about Cape independence. Is, yes. it, is it achievable? Does it make sense? Is it a racist thing? Is it, I'm throwing it in the air. What do you think? No, I don't think it's racist necessarily. I, I, I've spoken to a couple of people who are who seem to have 
good intentions. Um, there's no reason why in the world we shouldn't be able to separate into smaller and smaller units. I do believe that ultimately government is most responsible at its most lowly level. Yeah. So if you have municipalities that aren't living up to their promises, you can just ask those councillors. You know, I live in a residential estate and if there's a problem with the board, then you need to get involved and you can actually see real change in a matter of weeks. Whereas if you're dealing with the national or the federal government in America, you, that's, that's beyond most of our reach and, and our ability to affect change there is minimal. So I think if we can, if we can separate into ever smaller groups and, and people feel perhaps that their tax money isn't being squandered and on corruption, then perhaps, you know, perhaps there's something that we can, we can learn from that. So you think no, I'm not opposed to the idea. I think Cape Independence might be fun. Okay. I'm with that. Let's have a few more questions. Are you okay for another five, five or so minutes, Gary? I am. I am. I'm just I'm apparently with the president's addressing us this evening at eight o'clock. Ah, maybe he's listening. He's going to go. So, I trust you, the people. I trust well, maybe, you. Maybe he should We're just abandon this up. farcical lockdown. You know, let's just yeah. get rid of the level three. Then there's advanced level three and no, no. level 3.2.14. Just move on. Let's get on with it. So here's what Silver should do. I trust you, the people, to wear your masks, keep your spacing, be smart about things. You're sovereign individuals. You can make your own decisions. Be sensible. We're removing lockdown. Wouldn't that be lovely? Chances of that happening? <laughs> unless, sorry, unless you're listening, chances about zero. Um, um, <laughs> questions. Do you want to have a quick, quick look at uh, Gareth? A few questions here. Sure. You go ahead and choose whichever one you'd like. Many, uh, there's a couple of mad posts from people. Um, anything you want to ask? Uh, no, not really. Um, <laughs> why does it have to be so bloody cold is a good question. So who, I mean, I've got some terrific people for, I've had Piers Morgan and I've had President Kagami. I've got Candace Owens, uh, Tony Blair, a bit of a lefty, but he's... No, he's, yeah, yeah. I, 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 liked, uh, I liked some of the things yeah. Tony Blair did, yeah. Yeah, he was all right. Um, and quite a few other people. I'd love to have... Uh, some of them could you join me or you know absolutely I've got to, I've got i'll tell you what i'd like that. very much i'd like very much to borrow your address book for my tv show at some point happy to help you anytime <laughs> so we you. have a mantra in smutby and i know you've only been in smutby recently and that's to pass the goodness forward and i did steal this from a rather crappy hollywood movie that had kevin spacey in it and i actually met kevin he's i mean he's a rampant homosexual but he's actually a good guy great guy um, no he's a good guy and he never got convicted. You left. Yeah. He's never got. And the mantra in that story is a wonderful one. It's simply, if somebody does you a favor, you mm. don't pay them back. You pay it forward to someone else. And it's really got traction in Smutby. So you want my address book? It's yours. How about that? Anyone you want. Like, delighted Thank you. To that's, very, that's very kind of you. I appreciate that enormously. Thank you. So, Gareth, listen, what a pleasure. Um, I thought we'd be talking cuck and having a jaw and things like that. But actually, it's been a fantastic, fantastic discussion. Really enjoyed it. I'd love to have you back, as they say, or vice versa. Um, Thank you. I'm sure that's more than possible. And, Rob, it's a great pleasure to spend time with you. Thank you. And you get a pair of, you get a pair of felt squins as the prize for being on. That's uh, our sponsors from Nick Feltskin Drea. <laughs> you can have a Excellent. pair of pencil sort of sinners. The difference is Good. just the color of the... Uh, Laces. I must, I must, I must quickly protest and tell you that I have very good Afrikaans credentials, despite the fact that many Afrikaans people don't know this. My great grandmother laid the cornerstone of the Fortracker Monument. She was a descendant herself of Petra Tief and Andres Pretorius, so I therefore am as well. And yeah, my my our family Bible is is ensconced there in the Church of the Vow in Peter Maritzburg, and in, in fact, I think King Goodwill's Willatini owes my family a great deal of land. But we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> very good. Gareth, you're a star. Thank you. Love meeting you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank Enjoy. you. Bye-bye.